On this edition of Food for Life, Father Terry Donahue looks at moral relativism. Now, the opposite of moral relativism is moral absolutism, which holds that there are moral rules which are universally binding on everyone, which aren't just a matter of personal taste, but are objective truths outside of us that we discover. Today I'd like to speak with you about what Pope Benedict XVI calls the dictatorship of relativism. So first let's define what relativism is, and in particular I'll talk about moral relativism. Now some truths are relative. For example, if I say to you, chocolate ice cream is delicious, it's the best. Well that's a statement about my personal taste, so it's subjective. Taste can vary according to the individual subject, and I'm not going to fault somebody for liking vanilla better. Subjective truths are based on internal preferences, so they can change according to our feelings, even sometimes the time of day. But there are other truths that are absolute. For example, if I say 2 plus 2 equals 4, and someone else says, well, I believe that 2 plus 2 equals 5, well, I can say, I'm right and you're wrong because that's an objective truth that we learn from mathematics. Now, objective truths are realities in the external world that we discover through investigation. We can't change them according to our feelings or our preferences. Now, moral relativism holds that moral truths about what's right and what's wrong are subjective, just like our personal taste in ice cream. So a moral relativist believes that there are no universal moral rules that apply to everyone, everywhere. Now the opposite of moral relativism is moral absolutism, which holds that there are moral rules which are universally binding on everyone, which aren't just a matter of personal taste, but are objective truths outside of us that we discover. Now you might be aware of this already, but moral relativism is really running rampant in our Western society, especially on universities and college campuses, even in high schools. Many university students you might talk to would see relativism as something necessary to have a free society. They might say, the goal isn't to correct your mistakes and really be right. The goal is to realize that no one is right about anything. Everyone decides what's right and wrong for them. There's a book I read recently called, with, entitled Relativism by Francis Beckwith and Gregory Kukul. And they offered the following dialogue between a high school teacher and her student named Elizabeth. And this is actually based loosely on a real life exchange in a high school. Teacher says this, welcome students. This is the first day of class. And so I want to lay down some ground rules. First, since no one has the truth, you should be open-minded to the opinions of your fellow students. Second, uh, Elizabeth, do you have a question? And Elizabeth pipes up, says, yes, I do. If nobody has the truth, isn't that a good reason for me not to listen to my fellow students? After all, if nobody has the truth, why should I waste my time listening to other people and their false opinions? Only if somebody does have the truth does it make sense to be open-minded. Don't you agree? And the teacher responds, no, I don't. Are you claiming to know the truth? Isn't that a bit arrogant and dogmatic? Elizabeth, not at all. Rather, I think it's dogmatic as well as arrogant to assert that no single person on earth knows the truth. After all, have you met every person in the world and quizzed them exhaustively? If not, how can you make such a claim? Also, I believe it's actually the opposite of arrogance to say that I'm going to alter my opinions to fit the truth whenever and wherever I find it. And if I happen to think I have good reason to believe I know the truth about some things and I'd like to share it with you, why wouldn't you listen to me? Why would you automatically discredit my opinion before it's even uttered because I claim to know the truth? I thought we were supposed to listen to everyone's opinion. The teacher says, this should prove to be an interesting semester. 
And the class clown chimes in, ain't that the truth? <laughs> now here we see that claiming to have the truth can often make people respond rather uh, defensively. In a recent interview, Pope Benedict XVI talked about this and said many people are afraid when someone says, I have the truth. And one reason is because so much intolerance and so much cruelty has been done in the name of truth down through human history. And that's an important point to recognize. So Pope Benedict emphasizes that Christians must reject all use of force and all manipulation in proclaiming the truth. He says, the truth comes to rule not through violence, but rather through its own power. When brought before Pontius Pilate, Jesus professes that he himself is the truth and the witness to the truth. But he does not defend the truth with legions or armies, but rather makes it visible through his passion and thereby also implements the truth. Benedict goes on to say, one must be careful and cautious in claiming the truth. But simply to dismiss the truth as unattainable is really destructive. Because if we're incapable of truth, then we're incapable of ethical values, of moral living. We would have no standards. So as Catholics, we believe that we have the fullness of the truth, not because we're so smart and we figured it out for ourselves, but because we've received the truth as a gift from a higher authority, from God who is the source of all truth through Jesus Christ who said, I am the truth. So our claim as Christians to know the truth is not arrogance, but in fact, it requires humility because it takes humility to submit your life to the truth when you discover it. Now, in the 60s and the 70s, many schools began programs that they called values clarification programs. And this is the idea. You don't teach a particular set of moral values of what's right and wrong. Instead, you make students aware of their own feelings and their own ideas and beliefs about what's right and wrong so that they can make decisions based on their own values. Now this might seem like a, a neutral point of view that's not pushing anything, but that's false. Values clarification actually does push one particular point of view, and it's the view of moral relativism, that morality is based solely on your own feelings, your own ideas, your own beliefs and values. In Kukul's book on relativism, he recounts a true story that reveals the problems with this approach. A teacher was using the techniques of values clarification in her classroom in sixth grade. And he writes, the day came when her class of sixth graders announced that they valued cheating. And they wanted to be free to do it on their test in that class. Now the teacher, of course, was very uncomfortable. You know, she had been teaching this, you know, clarify your own values. So what was her solution? Well, she told the children that since it was her class and since she was opposed to cheating, they were not free to cheat. She said, in my class, you must be honest because I value honesty. But in other areas of your life, you may be free to cheat. Now think about this for a moment. Does the teacher's solution follow from the instruction she was just giving on values clarification to her students? Of course not. If the teacher values honesty, then she should be honest without imposing her honesty on her students. They should still be free to decide for themselves which they value more, and they had decided that. They valued cheating. So the teacher ends up having to impose her morality on her students just to have the class even work, the very thing she's been teaching against. <laughs> now, all she has to fall back on if she's a moral relativist to impose her rules on others because she has the power, she's the teacher. It's basically might makes right. Now that's not a foundation for morality. Whereas a moral absolutist can say, we've discovered that cheating is morally wrong, that lying is an absolute evil. And that's why 
we can impose the need to be honest on students in the classroom. Not because we're the strongest, but because we discovered a truth in the real world that everyone needs to accept in order for society to function and in order for the human being, for human person, to reach our goal, which is living in the truth. So values clarification and these other relativistic ideas are not neutral. They lead to moral dilemmas like we just described. And it also focuses in on the individual and isolates us from our family, from the rest of society, and from what we've learned in our culture. So this kind of values clarification is actually moral nonsense. It destroys our confidence in moral absolutes. And once we let go of moral absolutes, it's actually pretty easy to keep changing our personal morality to match our disordered desires. We might start with really high moral standards, but then we can slowly slide downwards as we make compromise after compromise. Now, Cardinal Ratzinger spoke of a dictatorship of relativism in a homily he gave in 2005, just before he was elected Pope Benedict XVI. And he stated this, we are building a dictatorship of relativism, which doesn't recognize anything as definitive and whose ultimate goal consists solely of one's own ego and desires. He went on to say that once relativism is embraced by a large portion of society, then relativism is imposed on everyone else through the force of law. Now, one example of this from, from history was the case of St. Thomas More, who was uh, basically imprisoned and then executed because he refused to sign or agree to an oath to recognize Henry VIII as the leader of the church in England. And because of his allegiance to the truth, he refused. And he became what's called a prisoner of conscience. That's an example of a dictatorship of relativism, where one person, because of their own ego and desires, then imposes a law on everyone else that is unjust. Now, when I talk about things such as this uh, with, with Catholics in, in homilies and things like that, Sometimes uh, Catholics can be very excited and say, you know, yeah, right on, rail against relativism, you know, but I'm a Catholic and I'm in the exclusive club, you know, I'm good. All these warnings of Jesus don't apply to me, do they? Well, you know, Catholics shouldn't be too quick to assume that they have a pass on, you know, uh, these issues. Because the kingdom of God is not just some exclusive club just for Catholics. In a recent homily in Germany, Pope Benedict XVI commented on Matthew 21, where Jesus says, tax collectors and harlots will enter the kingdom of God before the Pharisees. And Benedict translated Jesus' statement into the present day, saying, even agnostics who don't know if God exists, but are sincerely seeking to find out, those who are longing for a pure heart but suffer because of their sins, are closer to the kingdom of God then believers whose life of faith is routine regard the church as just a, an institution without letting faith touch their hearts. We need to let the Lord capture our hearts and not just profess faith with our lips. And the kingdom of God is not some exclusive club just for Catholics. The kingdom of God is radically inclusive of anyone who's sincerely seeking the truth and willing to submit to it when he finds it. So maybe today could be a call of action for you. If you realize your moral compass has been demagnetized by moral relativism, instead of just going along with the crowd or doing what feels good to you. Secondly, some of you might need to get right with God. Fall on the mercy of the Savior. Repent of, of sin that you're involved in. Confess your sins to the Lord. Others, I think all of us, really need to learn how to recognize these moral relativist arguments when we hear a speech or even in conversation around the water cooler at work. We shouldn't let this sloppy reasoning of relativism just slide on by. We should challenge it 
and expose the weaknesses of relativist arguments. And finally, we can teach our children that there are moral absolutes, that some things are really right and some things are really wrong. Yes, there's nuance in moral theology. There are cases that are complicated to figure out, but fundamentally, some things are true and some things are false. And at the end of our lives, we're gonna be held accountable for our actions based on how we responded to the invitation of Jesus Christ, to the graces we receive from God through him. But we shouldn't fear because we'll be facing a just judge who is the defender of the poor, the widow, the orphan. And on that day, when we're before the judgment seat of God, the just king will deliver all those who have been oppressed, all those who've been maltreated or abandoned or forgotten. He will destroy the shroud that's cast over all peoples. He'll wipe away the tears from all faces. And on that day, they will say with one strong voice, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. For an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Terry Donahue on Moral Relativism, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. When you write, ask for an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Terry Donahue on Moral Relativism. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at our character building journey. You're on a character building journey. Yes, I'm roughing you up. When the Israelites were making their way through the desert, God was trying to purify them from their idols. They were still attached to things that were not God. You know, there are some scripture verses that, you know, if you've been raised um, in the Christian faith or in the Catholic faith, you've heard them so many times you can become desensitized to them. But I wonder if you could try something. Try this going forward. Just try to read the scriptures as if you've, as if this is your first time reading them. And try and really get the full and literal sense. Let me, let me give you an example of a saying of Jesus that is really strong from Luke 17, uh, verse 5 and 6. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And so think about that. Think about the power that the Lord has given us. That's amazing that we would have that kind of power. You know, the more and more I read the scriptures, I think about, I'm meditating more on, well, what's, what are some of Jesus' assumptions when he says things? Like, what's he assuming? Well, what he's assuming here is that we are loved by him and by his Father and that we are brought into his life, that we are made sons and daughters. Jesus says in John 1, he gave them power so they could become children of God. In Peter, 1 Peter says we become partakers of the divine nature. So when we come into the life of God, we're like, we're like royalty. There's a, there's a dignity and a stature that we have. But what we also have is a tremendous authority <laughs> that you could say, all right, tree, go into the water. That's a tremendous authority that the Lord has given us. I think it's wow. So I've been thinking about this whole authority thing over the last few months, and uh, I've had some funny situations that, um, that I want to share with you. And if if you find these uh, like really too goofy, write to us at Food for Life, and and uh, we'd like to hear from you. But a couple of a couple of funny, a couple of funny stories. Um, 
in this church that I'm in right now, um, we've had uh, a number of events where I had to operate the, the soundboard. And while I sort of have a technical bent, um, I'm not really good with stuff that's kind of hands-on. I'm more of an ideas guy, you know. I'm, I'm very good with software, but not too good with hardware. So when it comes to hands-on, tactile stuff, I'm really not very adept. And, uh, but nevertheless, this one time I had to operate the soundboard and figure all this out. I wrote everything down, I still didn't quite get it. Anyway, so one time on Good Friday, um, the sound system wasn't working. And there were five guys clustered around the soundboard. And one of them noticed me and said, hey, Chris, come over, you know something about the soundboard. I'm thinking, oh, brother, I don't know anything about the soundboard. I said, Chris, what's wrong with the soundboard? And <laughs> what kind of came out of me was, in Jesus' name, come on, <laughs> turn on. And the sound system turned on right then and there. Everybody was like, looking, what did you do? What did you do? Did you do anything? Did you do anything? Did you do anything? <laughs> Example number one. Example number two, I was visiting um, a chap in the hospital, and he was, um, he was near the end and in a lot of discomfort. And uh, he was, you know, trying to watch some TV just to kind of distract himself from his discomfort. And again, couldn't get the, the volume to work on the, on the remote, and I spent five, ten minutes uh, trying to get this to work. I, I went to the front desk. I said, can you, can you bring a technician in? <laughs> and after 15 minutes, I just felt, oh, I should pray. So I said, oh, Lord, just fix this thing. No, 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 that's not what I mean by pray. Oh, boy, in Jesus' name, turn on. Sure enough, the sound, <laughs> the sound comes on on the television, just like out of the blue. So what do you think about those stories? I know, they're, I know they're a little bit crazy, but they definitely come out of this idea of the authority that the Lord has given us. We see clearly in the scriptures how he gave authority to the 12 and then to the 72 and then, and then beyond. He gave them authority to cast out demons and heal the sick and raise the dead. And this authority comes from who we are. You know, reading this, you could kind of think that anyone who's doing this is being very presumptuous. To exercise this kind of authority is extremely presumptuous. And you know, it is if it's something that wasn't given us. But the fact of the matter is that when we're, we're brought into this beautiful life with God and that we are made sons and daughters, this is part of the package is this tremendous authority that God has given us. So maybe in your own life, you know, you're not feeling like you have too much authority. You don't feel like you have it, but you do. Did you know you have spiritual authority over what is response, what, what you are responsible for? Whether that's, you know, your family or your workplace, that there's a realm in which you're to exercise the authority of Jesus. And maybe it's not always in this dramatic fashion, right? But part of that authority is exercised through how we steward <clears throat> the things that God's given us. That we exercise our responsibility uh, based on the values that Jesus has given us. And some of those values are it isn't all about this life. There's more than meets the eye. That, that what drives us is about what's here and the life to come. So that's the authority that the Lord has given you, and he wants you to exercise it. He doesn't want you to be sheepish about it. He doesn't want kind of a false humility. Yes, he wants us to be humble. To be humble means that the power comes from him, but you have authority nonetheless. An unhumble response is that the power comes from us. So it's important here to be humble, but it's important to have the, the right notion. Humility means what's the source of your power? It's not a question of whether you have power. You have power as a result of your baptism. You have the power of the Holy Spirit, no less. Let us pray. 
Father, we, we thank you for the tremendous calling that you've placed on our lives. We thank you that you've given us this chance to build and extend your kingdom. Lord, we thank you that you've called us into this wonderful relationship with you that makes us sons and daughters, no less. It's given us a beautiful dignity and stature. Lord, you've also given us an authority that you want us to exercise over temporal matters. Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom. As Solomon prayed, Lord, that we would have wisdom first to know and to judge you, with your heart the things that you've entrusted to us. And Lord, help us to also be open to, to exercising authority in a supernatural way when it's demanded, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this exciting life to which you've called us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We always give thanks to you who so regularly support us in your prayers and your financial gifts. Without you, the ministry simply could not continue. God works through you to make the ministry continue so that people can have the hope that the gospel brings to each one who hears it. I want to read a couple of short letters to you today just to let you know that this investment that you've made in Food for Life really does touch the hearts and lives of others. One gentleman writes and says, We continue to enjoy the Food for Life ministry. It's our hope and prayer that more people will become regular listeners of your program. Our prayer is that they'll open their minds and hearts and listen to God's Word and be more willing to follow the path of the Holy Spirit. Another couple writes to us from Quebec and says, Thank you so much for your program. It's always a source of spiritual guidance which meets the needs of our souls. We love each and every one of you, and we hope you'll continue to be present to us for many more years with your obviously Holy Spirit-led teachings. And I thank these viewers for taking the time to write. And again, I thank you for your faithful support. If Food for Life has helped you in some way, we do need to hear from you. Certainly, these are challenging economic times, and we are sensitive to that. If you are able to help with a one-time gift, if you're able to support us on a monthly basis, we would be most grateful. We want to continue to just share the message of hope that we have in Christ. Please write to us today. For an audio CD or video DVD of today's ministry, we invite you to write to us. When you write, mention the program number 1432 and today's topic, Father Terry Donahue on Moral Relativism. Food for Life is a nonprofit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. If every viewer gave a loony or a toonie each week, all expenses would be met. If you have never donated before, we ask that you make your check payable to Food for Life, and our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. You may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at our character building journey. You're on a character building journey. Yes, I'm roughing you up. When the Israelites were making their way through the desert, God was trying to purify them from their idols. They were still attached the things that were not God. For an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Terry Donahue on Moral Relativism, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. When you write, Ask for an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Terry Donahue on Moral Relativism.